I uh, failed to mention one thing earlier this morning, and that was that we had a pretty good group go and uh, help at the Southeastern Children's Home yesterday. We want to thank them for that and that encouragement they give to that good work in uh, Duncan, South Carolina. So thank you for that. So uh, about a week ago, Robin asked me what I would be speaking on this morning. And I'd been giving it considerable thought. And it's not unusual for her to ask, as I, I, we typically discuss these things. And I'm always looking for the affirmation and support. So I told her, I said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I think I'm going to talk about patience and waiting and what that means. And I didn't get quite the response I normally get. You know, the, oh, that's a great topic, or you'd be great at that. It was more like, I got to text the kids and tell them to stream this. And then she texted them and said, you won't believe what dad is talking on. Because admittedly, I am not known as the most patient person in the household of bidding, okay? That title, that title goes to my wife. Uh, you know, Robin, if you know Robin, you know she is singularly the most patient person around. And I'm here to tell you it's because of me. I will take full credit for the 32 years we've been together that I have given her ample opportunity to practice and perfect her patience. So you are, you're welcome, right? Um, but conversely, she has helped me practice my waiting because if you've lived with a patient person, you will have to wait, all right? And she has given me ample opportunity to practice my waiting over the years. And I, and I keep, keep working on that and I struggle with it as many of us do. And when I, when I put a lesson together, oftentimes I'm preaching to myself, right, as it should be. If I were to ask for a show of hands this morning and ask the congregation, who here amongst us likes and enjoys waiting? If, you, if I get too many hands raising, I'm going to have to audible last second and probably go to a lesson on lying to oneself. <laughs> we don't like to wait. It's not in our mindset. It's not in our culture. It's not in our society today, right? I mean, if you think about all the technological advances in, in, in our lifetime, probably over the course of entire man's existence, the purpose for these advancements is usually, it roots back to cutting down a time frame on something, right? Becoming more efficient so that we don't have to wait. Think of the last 15 years of what's been invented and what we carry in our pockets today and how we are instantaneously able to order anything online and have it at our house in two days. And if heaven forbid it doesn't show up on that second day, what, what do we do? We go, if you're like me, you go right to the phone and you start finding out where's this package. We don't like to wait. The entire entertainment industry has changed because of it. You can now stream episode after episode instantaneously, wherever, however you like, and you don't even have to wait through the commercials or wait until the next episode, episode comes out, right? So more and more in our society and our culture, we are being pushed towards a people who don't have to and cannot tolerate waiting. It can be difficult to wait and to be patient. You know, it can be an even bigger challenge when we have strife, unrest. You know, I think of James and James 5, and, and you think of the, 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 you just think about everything that was going on with his audience and as he wrote to them. And what did he teach them as they were being persecuted? What did he teach to them as those that were persecuting them were seemingly getting ahead? He taught them patience. He taught them patience as he instructed them to look towards the second coming. And if you're anything like me, patience is something you have when there are too many witnesses around. Right? But that's not the definition of patience. We know that Patience is the ability to tolerate delay or suffering or strife without getting angry or upset. Not an easy thing to do. And in Galatians 5.22, we see that patience is a fruit of the Spirit, but it's not one that we talk about a lot, right? It'd be nothing for me to come up here and give you another lesson on joy and love and peace, but we get to patience and we don't have time for that one, right? So we, we, we tend to gloss over that one from time to time. See, patience is not the ability to wait, as much as it is how we act while we are waiting. Patience is not the ability to wait, but how we act while we are waiting. Yet the fact of the matter is we know we wait every day for something, whether it's something that we really want, something that we really need, 
Again, I'm an impatient person, so I didn't do too much research. I just Googled it. How long does somebody wait? And it just popped up instantaneously, and it did the math for me. You'll have to double check it, because again, I wasn't patient enough to run the numbers myself. But it said, and this was stats from a couple years ago, so it might be even more now, but it said that the average person waits about one hour every day on something, be it waiting to check out at the counter, at the, at the grocery store, a traffic light, the bridge construction, that, that average is about to go up. I'm here to tell you now, okay? In Rock Hill, it's about to go up your waiting time. But we wait about an hour every day, and if you span that over, say, a 70-year lifespan, that, that equates to three years, three years of waiting just on something to happen. So we know the problem isn't waiting. That's natural. That's normal. The problem is how we act and how our heart is while we wait. Again, it's pretty easy. Maybe I'm the only one, but it's pretty easy to find fault with those ahead of you in line as you are waiting. And if we're not careful, that waiting can lead us to frustration, bitterness, heaven forbid, even maybe anger in our heart. And if that's how we are towards others, how is it that we respond to God when God makes us wait? You see, God wants us to have full expectations that he is going to be there for us and the full power of God is behind us. But God doesn't just want to fix our problems. He wants to transform us in the process. We know this. And there are times where we are just going to have to wait. When we think of waiting in our society, we think of a passive activity. Passivity, right? I practiced that word a lot this week. Passivity, passivity, okay. But when we think of waiting, we think of grabbing the number at the DMV, sitting in the corner, playing with our phone until our number is called. That's why we don't like it. We're people of action. We want to do things. But that's not biblical waiting. Biblical waiting is actually a very active approach, active and we show it through our dependence and our obedience towards God. That is biblical waiting. And so today I want to touch on seven practical ways that we can practice biblical waiting and hopefully apply some of those to our lives. And before you get too anxious, I know it's seven points. Be patient with me. These will go fairly quick. Um, seven ways, seven ways where we can wait. And I don't know how to use this thing, so I've told them that, but... You turn it on. Well, that wouldn't work. See, you turn it on. Okay, there we go. It already, uh, okay. Okay, so in my defense, there's an arrow on one and not on the other. So, I mean, we need to put an arrow on this thing. We're going backwards. We're going to go back. Connor, get up here and lead another song. First, when we wait, we need to actively acknowledge that God is sovereign and that God is in control. You know, this can be a difficult practice, but in order to get good at waiting, we need to acknowledge that God is in control and there is nothing we are presently experiencing as a people, as a nation, that God is not fully in control over. And I think we tend to forget that. Consider uh, the words of the wise king in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13 through 14. It says, consider the work of God, who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. So that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Yes, uh, you know, God is in control. We can't forget this. Even when times are tough and... Uh, just seemingly the morality of our nation and our society is just it just it's just spiraling downward every time you turn on the news every time you open up your laptop every time you talk to somebody it just seems like there's just this strife going on but god is still in control think of it this way if it were up to us to fix the problems of our society we would probably make them worse than they are today it's not up to us and that God is still in control. We can't straighten what God has made crooked. We can't do it as much as we want to fix everything. But we can do is we can wait. We can wait and acknowledge that God is in control over all. 
Job rightly confessed in 121 that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And in Proverbs 3, 5, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, God is sovereign and God is in control over everything. So as we wait, let us remember and acknowledge that he is sovereign. Number two, we need to speak spirit, seek spiritual strength from the Lord as we wait. You know, our helplessness becomes especially obvious uh, during times of misfortune. You know, it gets really, gets really rough on us when, when life throws curveballs at us. But it's at that time that we need to lean on the Lord and find strength. We're going to be doing a lot of scripture out of Psalms this morning, so you can put your thumb there, your phone towards Psalm. But we're going to do a lot in Psalms because when you go to Psalms, there's a storehouse of wonderful prayers that in particular speak towards asking God for his help Psalm 33, verse 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And then later on, or earlier on in 27, 14, it says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And then we see in 31, 24, it says, Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. You know, we don't suffer from a lack of anything. We really don't. We see that in Psalm 23. We don't suffer from a lack of anything right now. I don't care if the grocery stores run out of all of our essential needs or the hospitals run out of the beds or all the supplies or gas prices go high, whatever happens. We are in lack of nothing that we truly need because we can rest secure that in Christ, he has given us our most essential need. That's a right relationship with him. Let us seek him for spiritual strength as we wait. Number three, this is the tough one for me personally. So I threw it in here. I should, this should have been one through seven for me. But as we wait, we need to learn to be patient and we need to learn to be quiet. You know, there's a lot of examples that we can find in the Bible, a lot of stories that talk about the need for being quiet as we wait on the Lord. I instantly thought of one, uh, you'll probably think of a better one, but I thought of one revolving around Joshua and the walls of Jericho, right? So we find in this text where the Israelites finally get there after their 40 years of wandering around, and what do they find? They find these tall walls and the people there, they go inside their walls and it's like, what are we going to do? How are we going to defeat this great enemy? And what does Joshua command the children of Israel to do? To march around the walls of Jericho and in particular, he asks them for those first six days to march around those walls. How? In silence. Quiet. You got to think that somewhere someone was thinking in their mind, how are we going to win this battle without flaming arrows, without shouting and hollering, without battering rams? We're just going to take a leisurely stroll and quietly do so. How does that do anything? But, you know, Joshua had to remember those 40 years. Can you imagine what was being said during those 40 years? The doubt. The background noise. You see, I think, you know, Joshua had to be like, well, we, I can't allow these people to speak because we can't allow anything coming from their lips that might discourage each other to the point where this victory that we've been guaranteed will be taken from us because of the words that we speak. I think that's just as true for us today. We need to be careful that we don't face great obstacles and allow words to come from our lips that bring about unbelief internally especially but externally as well you know we should prohibit demoralizing speech from our lips during times of strife and times of trouble what happened on that seventh day they marched around again and as god commanded they gave out a loud shout and those walls came down you see Sooner rather than later, when we call on the Lord, we will see salvation. Through this example, we understand that words can bind us up or set us free. 
We can't help uh, what we see or what we hear. We can't help that. But our refusal to speak doubt and fear will keep our hearts inclined more towards God and what he can do than what we know we cannot. You know, even though we live in an American spirit of activity and, and doing things and busyness, it's good for us to stop. It's good for us to stop, sit still for a moment, to be quiet. This is part of God glorifying waiting. In Lamentations 3, verse 26, it, is, it says, It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. In Psalm 62, 5, it says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. When we're still and when we're silent, that's when we can best listen to God. We can listen to what he speaks to us through his word, and we can realize what it is that he might be teaching us. Maybe it's patience. Quiet patience is an important part of waiting because it should drive us to hope in God. Number four, have you ever worried about something that later on you realize you shouldn't have even been thinking about? Especially when you're idle and you're waiting for something to happen. I've got a child that does this. I won't identify which one, but it's, it's my middle child. <laughs> she can run every scenario in her mind as to what is going to happen as she's waiting for something to occur. And it's never, well, I shouldn't say never, but it's not always all of the good scenarios, right? Do we have some of that, you know? I think she gets it from her dad. We call it planning, right? But sometimes that planning can lead to worry, needless worry. You know, fear can be helpful. We know this. It's a response during difficult or dangerous times that can help us in those times. But it can also be something that, if we're not careful, will overwhelm us to the point where we take our eyes off of Christ. Again, you can think of many examples of this in the Bible. I mean, instantly, I think of Peter on the water, right, where he was fixed on Christ and he was fine. And then some fear and some worry and some doubt all kind of intertwined, crept in. And then he took his eyes off the Lord. And we know what happened there. The remedy to fear in our lives is God himself. And as we wait, we need to try our best to refrain from that needless fear and worry. Psalm 56, 3 through 4 says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Psalm 46, 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble as it's swelling. Why wouldn't we trust in a God like that, no matter what's going on in the world around us, as we wait for something to happen? And of course, we know Jesus himself instructs us about anxiety and being anxious. In Matthew 6, 25, he says, don't be anxious for our life, for what we eat, for what we wear, for where we're going to stay. I'm paraphrasing here, right? But he says, you know, God takes care of the birds. They don't do, about, do anything about those, those uh, particularly worldly items. Aren't you worth more to him than they? We need to refrain from needless fear and worry. Number five, while we wait, an activity we should be practicing as the Lord's body is that we should be continuing to learn, obey, and share God's commands. Waiting usually connotates there's some time involved. And while we have that time, let's use that time. And one way we could be actively waiting in a biblical way is by continuing to learn and apply God's word. You know, this is what the psalmist says in Psalm 119. He found peace in an in a, in a, in a odd place for some. In verse 52, it says, When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort. O Lord, your statutes have been my song in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, and I keep your law. 
As we wait on the Lord, we're to grow in knowledge of him and what he would have us to do with our lives. We should diligently seek and apply his laws. And why should we do that? Simply so that we should stay close to him. That we will uh, do our best to avoid drifting into the error of the world and the patterns of disobedience that we see all around us. And ultimately, so that we can show a better way to those who are not doing so. We can't do that if we are not honestly doing our best to continue to learn, apply, and live out his words for us. I like the verses in 2 Peter 3, 14, and then a little later on, 17 through 18. It says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And then later on it says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Don't lose your own stability as you're carried away with their lawlessness. But... Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Number six. This is a good one, and I think this is one that this congregation does a good job at. While we wait, we should be seeking the Lord through constant prayer. In Acts chapter 12, we are uh, reminded of the importance of prayer during difficult times. And I see a parallel somewhat to what's going on in our day and that the church was being persecuted on a daily basis. There we find King Herod is using the sword against those that are believers in Christ. John's uh, brother James, uh, one of the original 12, was killed. Peter, one of the closest disciples to Christ, he's found being laid hands upon and thrown into prison. And how did the members of that Jerusalem church respond to this distressing news of the day and what was going on politically? Did they mourn? Probably. Did they fear? Possibly. But did they pray? Definitely. In verse 5, we find them in earnest prayer, and God hears those prayers. And in verse 12, we see that After obtaining his freedom from that dungeon through the help of an angel, Peter heads to the house of John Mark. And what does he find when he gets there? He finds a group, many gathered together, pleading with God in prayer together. Romans 12, 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we've already seen, our waiting should not be that of inaction, but rather of activity. We should actively be praying for the deliverance of our Lord. When the rest of the world is panicking, when our nation seems to be in a downward spiral, the church should be praying. That's what we should be doing. Number seven, and this is our last one. We need to remain hopeful. Actively remain hopeful as we wait. Do you ever find yourself waiting for something and then as time goes on, that hope starts to wane a little bit? Even on minor things, as time passes, it's harder and harder to keep up hope that the outcome will be as we want it to be, that the promises made will be told. You know, I remember just taking a journey to Disney World with my parents as a kid And I knew where we were going. We were on the way. We were pointed that direction. But an hour into the trip, my hope started to dwindle, just even in an hour. Are we we there yet? Are we really going? Are we there? Don't we find ourselves sometimes waiting for things and our hope starts to dwindle? We need to remain hopeful as Christians. Again, in John 5, it tells a story that you know from your youth of a crippled man. 38 years he waited. 38 years is a long time to wait, waiting to be healed. So he laid alongside a pool of water where miracles regularly happened, but being in the state physically that he was in, after all that time, 
he never seemed quite to get to the water in time. Someone else would just push past him and get there before he would. When you've been waiting for so long and everybody keeps pushing past you, it's easy to lower your expectations and your hope. When your blessing has been delayed for so long and your life has been defined by a particular problem, if we're not careful, it can become our identity. You know, Jesus saw this man and he understand what was happening in his heart, of course. And he asked him in uh, verse 6, I believe, he says, do you wish to get well? And the man, of course, responded immediately. And in that moment, 38 long years of waiting had come to an end. All those long years of waiting had not moved this man's heart past hope. He still had great expectations, and because of that, he was healed. Just like the crippled man at the pool, we continue to wait on the return of our Lord and Savior. Just like him, no matter what's going on in our lives that we keep praying about and we're waiting for, we cannot allow our heart to be moved past hope. Hope on what has been promised to us. And it's important that we, re that we remain hopeful in this promise. 2 Peter 3, verse 11 through 13 says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's in his promise that we are waiting. John 14, 2 through 4 tells us about how a place has been prepared for us. We just simply need to wait until that day comes. When we go through tough times and our patience begins to run out, we need to remain hopeful in the promise that we've been given by God. Revelations 21 talks about how he's going to wipe away every tear. There's going to be no more pain, no more suffering. All the former things will be passed away because he's going to make everything new. We must remain hopeful. Again, I'm preaching this lesson to myself more than anybody else. And I hope that as you look at these, I briefly touched on them. But I hope you'll study them a little bit further in the coming days and weeks and apply them to your lives because it's important as a body here that we remain hopeful, that we remain patient, that we actively wait in a godly way that others can see what we are doing we can do this by showing those around us that we understand God to be sovereign and in control. We can express our dependence by waiting patiently, avoiding worry, by living obediently and seeking him in prayer as we remain hopeful for his return. Waiting on the blessings of God in our life can either fill your heart with great expectation or frustration leading to bitterness. Ultimately, the choice is up to us. You see, what we are, what we have been, what we intend to be, that's going to be shown more in the patience that we exhibit than any other virtue. Let me say that again. Who we are, what we intend to be, will be exhibited more by the patience that we show than any other virtue. You know, all of this talk this morning of how waiting is important and there's a way to wait, and that is important. But I don't want you to misunderstand the whole lesson, and that's this. There are some things that we shouldn't delay. There's some things we shouldn't be waiting on. We shouldn't be waiting to make things right with a brother or sister where reconciliation needs to occur or forgiveness needs to be given. Let's not wait on someone else to take that first step towards reconciliation. Let's not delay that. We shouldn't be waiting to make things right with God if you've fallen away or gone off that path towards heaven. Don't wait to take that first step back onto the narrow way. Don't delay. 
And please don't wait to become a Christian. Don't be like King Agrippa in Acts 26 where he says, I'm almost persuaded, but continue to wait. Don't wait to take that first step down this aisle this morning where we're going to be waiting for you to help you with whatever needs you might have, whatever they are. Don't wait. Please come forward as we stand and as we sing.